Imagine a knock at your door and an officer standing outside. It might surprise you to learn that this officer has come to inform you that you have an infectious disease and is there to escort you to lockup until you can be transferred to an industrial farm. This is exactly what happened to Maddie Wood, a 33-year-old widow on December 31st, 1930. Maddie is not unique in this experience. Ultimately, thousands of Kansan women and girls were affected by quarantine laws from 1917 to 1955 because they were deemed a threat to the moral fiber of servicemen. Welcome to Kansas History, a Journal of the Central Plains podcast, a collaborative project of the Kansas Historical Foundation and Department of History at Kansas State University. I am your host, Lisa Caitlin Highsmith, and today I am joined by Professor Chris Lovett, who will be discussing his article, Bad Girls, Sex, Shame, Public Health, and the Forgotten Legacy of Samuel J. Crombine in Kansas, 1917-1955. Professor Christopher C. Lovett was born and raised in New Jersey. Following his graduation from high school in 1966, he enrolled at the College of Emporia and graduated with a BA in History and Political Science in May 1970. In the fall of 1970, he enrolled in the MA program at Kansas State Teachers College at Emporia. While there, he received his draft notice and was inducted into the U.S. Army in June of 1971 and was deployed to Vietnam. Upon his return, he resumed his studies and completed his M.A. in History in 1975 and an M.L.S. in 1978. His teaching career began at Topeka High School and continues to his current position as Professor of History at Emporia State University. In between, Lovett has taught at the University of Iowa and Fort Hayes State University. He has written extensively on Kansas history, the Cold War, and national security affairs, as well as Russian and Soviet military history. He is also a book reviewer for Choice, the Journal of American History, the Journal of American Studies, and the Journal of Popular Culture. Hello, Professor Lovett. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Lisa. I'm glad to be here. First, Professor Lovett, what drew you to this study on health advocate Samuel J. Crumbine and his impact on women? Please give our listeners a sense of who Crumbine was in Kansas history. I was finishing up a, an article on a lynching in Leavenworth in 1901 called The Public Burning, which was published in Kansas history. I was tracking sex offenders, and I wanted to see how Kansas handled sexual assault cases. And I ran across a ledger listing women who were incarcerated at the Kansas State Prison in Lansing. A whole wing was uh, assigned to women. And I found all these women incarcerated for violating what is called Chapter 205. And I asked one of the archivists, I said, what, what is Chapter 205? And we spent a good part of the afternoon uh, looking through Kansas statutes to discover that 205 was a quarantine provision of the state law. And that basically was the beginning of my, uh, my project there. Crumbine was a frontier doctor, began his career in, in Dodge City. Matter of fact, Doc is the character portrayed in Gunsmoke based upon the life of uh, Samuel J. Crumbine. Later on, he becomes Secretary of the Board of Health uh, and moves to Topeka at the turn of the century and played a key role in Kansas Health from uh, 1904 all, all the way through uh, the early 1920s. Would you say your research and writing on this particular topic is a corrective to what has been his legacy? Yes, I would say that's the case. When you take a look at Crumbine's legacy, most of the writers and the, and the people that look at Crumbine fail to mention his role in the sterilization law, Chapter 205, dealing with incarceration or interning people with head infectious diseases, better known as a quarantine law. Now, there were other quarantine laws, but when Kansas passed the new quarantine law in 1917, they didn't designate what were the diseases that were going to lead to one's incarceration and deem those diseases more of a threat to public health than other diseases. As a matter of fact, when they were debating this in the Kansas House, the men actually laughed, as one news report said, nearly to death because they were so embarrassed when they were discussing some of these things. Do these quarantine laws affect men and women equally, or is it skewed in one direction in particular? Initially, they were both men and women. Then in 1919, uh, there was a case called Ex parte McGee. Charles Scott, uh, one of the plaintiff attorneys in the Brown v. Board of Education case, defended uh, a few pimps who were incarcerated at the state 
prison in Lansing uh, and by for violating their habeas corpus rights. And the Supreme Court of the state of Kansas said in Ex parte McGee that habeas corpus only applies to those that are incarcerated for a crime, not for a health code violation. But because these men actually did this, men were eventually phased out of the program and were treated by uh, local doctors or public health service uh, medical stations running throughout the state. Would you set the historical stage for us? How does Crumbine get on this path towards quarantine and sterilization laws and, say, getting the backing of legislators? First off, Kansas had no idea. Crumbine and the State Board of Health had no idea of the, the level of infectious syphilis and gonorrhea in the state. They, they were just guessing. There were no statistics in the uh, State Board of Health at the, at the time. But prostitution was now being attacked by what is called uh, the purity crusade. Uh, moral reforms. We had the Comstock laws. As a matter of fact, it was a, an offense that one could wind up in prison. Prostitution was being defeated, not because prostitution ever ended, but because they were closing down bordellos and body houses or public nuisances at the time. I could track, matter of fact, in my first article on the lynching for Alexander in the public burning, I was tracking brothels that I identified in like 1870. Uh, and they were still in operation, but under new ownership all the way through the turn of the century. And prostitution was a money-making proposition at the time. Uh, women were rotated from various localities, from Leavenworth to Lawrence to Emporia to Manhattan to Junction City. They were some of them were farm girls who were much like were recruited into it. But it was it was a major business. You had property owners, you had renters, you had doctors, you had the police, all profiting from this. I could identify certain days of the month when the police would raid a, a brothel and actually bring the women in. And if it was a low-class brothel, they would be paying like $5. If it was an upper-class brothel, they would be paying 10 or $15. The brothel owner would be paying $25 every month at a certain period of time. So everyone was on the table. C. D. Cotting, who was a warden at the state prison in, in Lansing, he was doing his best uh, to close these down. And, and he did. Matter of fact, he threatened uh, in an article through the century that basically these men should be, men and women, should serve time in prison for, for their offenses. Usually they, they would just get a slap on the wrist and they go back to work. What role did World War I play into these quarantine laws? They really amplified the situation because now you had uh, the draft men volunteered for the service and there was a fear that these men were infected or would be infected by prostitutes. The government passed what is called the American Plan to close down all brothels within five miles of the military installation. Matter of fact, it was so effective that they warned the city of New Orleans that they would move their naval base in New Orleans if they didn't close Storyville, probably one of the most colorful uh, red light districts in the history of the United States. But Crumbine plays a key role in this. He promises Rupert Blue that he volunteers that I could create cantonment areas or concentration camps to round up these women who are trying to infect American doughboys. It's important for that. Now, you've got to remember, American servicemen, good boys, when they go into service, they're breaking the bonds with their parents. They're now on their own. They want to test the bounds of their youth, so to speak. There's, there's no more parental restraints on them. And so most servicemen at the turn of the century and into World War I uh, were interested when they were at a cantonment area, you know, or the, what I call the four W's. We were women and watered down whiskey. And so Crumbine is actually trying to, to close those down. And then you have other women. They would follow their their loved ones uh, to uh, Camp Bunsley. Darlene Doubleday Newby, she was uh, eventually used as a participant observer in the industrial home. They opened it up to check on these women. And she claimed that these women were having sex with a partner every 24 hours. And that's highly unlikely. But they talked about these young girls that gave up their virtue to be with their loved one. And that's the term that she would use. She called them actually the patriotudes. Not prostitutes, but patriotudes. They were wayward girls. Maybe they had adenoid problems. The idea was that if Girls had an adenoid problem. You know, they increased their sexuality and their level of delinquency. And so uh, that had to be taken care of. But that's what they were trying to do. But for the most part, you know, they, they defeated prostitutes. As a matter of fact, looking at my study, most of the women that are arrested are interned at the industrial farm after 1918. Most of them are not there for prostitution. But most scholars, when you look at this, they find that women had very limited jobs. You know, they were waitresses. So some women may say prostitutes in waiting, but they had so few job opportunities. They were either housewives, 
needs cooks, waitresses, maybe they worked in a hotel. That was another thing. Since they closed the brothels, these women basically frequent hotels. But you could be arrested on just mere suspicion. But but I think we should talk about how actually this quarantine law actually worked, which is intriguing. Kansas State Legislature didn't authorize a procedure. They let the Department of Health come up with the plan. That's why there was some opposition to it. Uh, you're abrogating your authority to an unelected body to make decisions. So they met in Lawrence in March of 1918, about 13 months after the passage of the law. And, and what they did was, if anyone went to a doctor or to a pharmacy and sought any help in, in relation to a viral infection, they would have to notify the local public health official, the county health officer. The county health officer then would have to go to a justice of the peace and notify either the police or the county sheriff to have you arrested and detained and then moved to the newly opened industrial farm for women. Now, the industrial farm was created, I might add. The good women, the, the flower club societies, what we call them the do-gooders, you know, upper-class females were, were concerned that women were being incarcerated in the male prison in a separate room. They thought that was inappropriate. They should have a separate facility for women. So they created a prison without walls. That's what the industrial farm was. And so it winds up, Crumbine says, this is perfect for us. We could take all these women who are being rounded up for violating 205 and send them there. Julia Perry was the first superintendent. She made her name for herself working at the Boyd School. And she's a do-gooder, too. She starts off from the Methodist Church and youth activities like that. She plays a key role. And, and the women liked her, not realizing that she was part of the problem, too. Because if you look at the prison interview sheets that they began to use in 1923, one of the questions was, what was the cause of your downfall? When did you cross the line? And what made you do what you did? I mean, that's, that's what they were asking. And they didn't ask that of men. They only asked that of women. And Crumbine and the other reformers begin to see women as the vector in the spreading of venereal infections. What role does eugenics play in creating the perceptions that Crumbine and his fellow reformers have? It's, it's all part of the eugenic movement. Uh, matter of fact, you break eugenics down into two forms, positive and negative eugenics. Combined with the quarantine law of 205 is the sterilization law. They, they go hand in hand, and they're both forms of negative eugenics. Now, the positive eugenics is, is something that, that Crumbine was very interested in. In 1919, he hires Florence Brown Sanborn from Iowa to run the child's hygiene department. And she creates the Fitter Baby Boom. And he's very concerned about child hygiene and infant hygiene. And what happens is they begin this program in, in, in 1920 at the Free Fairgrounds in Topeka. And one of the things to show you how uncaring Crumbine was, was that to be part of that program, you had to go through a serological test for syphilis and gonorrhea for every family that took a part in that program. But never once did you find Crumbine advocate for serological testing for married couples, which would have solved part of the problem. I, I estimated 20 to 25 percent of all married couples or couples about to be married, the female was infected by their, their future husband or husband. And so that could have been alleviated. A number of states in the mid-1930s had already had serological testing for marriage. Kansas tried in 1941. It was defeated in the House, and it wouldn't be passed until 1947. And uh, it would have solved part of the problem if Crumbine was really concerned about that. Now, the question we, we should ask is, why did they really think this? Well, I mean, why would Crumbine, Davenport, Laughlin all think about this? I mean, they're working in rural areas. What's better when you take a look at and better stock? How do you create a better heifer, basically, by better breeding. How do you have a better chicken, better breeding? It's very simplistic when you take a look at it. It was very popular. People believed it. You know, the judges believed it. Lawyers believed it. Opinion makers believed it. It was, it was accepted by everyone that was anyone believed in, in eugenics. There were very few voices heard challenging those assumptions, even though it is a false science. Is there a tension between those who advocate for a more moral approach versus a scientific approach in, let's say, treating patients with syphilis? There was. With Paul Ehrlich's discovery of Salversan, sometimes known as 606, the first effective treatment for syphilitics, people felt that no longer could you isolate these people. Uh, you could treat them in hospitals. Moral reformers, on the other hand, these people have to be shunned because they're too promiscuous. They're having risky sexual activity. It's, it's like their view of it, the moral reformers, was simply say no. Much like what you have in the Reagan years with outbreak of AIDS. I mean, they would have agreed with Nancy Reagan 
simply say no. They having sex. Uh, and then women were divided on this issue, too, because it was sort of a sexual solidarity. You know, all women should be treated equally. You know, the, the prostitutes, you can't condone what they're doing. You have to suppress it because it may have an impact on other women, good women, so to speak. Like, what was the term they used in the 19th century for prostitutes, like in, in the West? Soiled doves or fallen women. I mean, you see that all the time. You can take a look at literature. If you even take a look at Eric Maria Remarque's book, All Quiet West the Front, published in the 1920s. I mean, when Paul goes home, what does his mother say? Paul, be careful of those French girls. You know, men were advised by their mothers to, to look out for their sons because their sons may be influenced by these wayward women that would take advantage of them and may affect them. Matter of fact, I have a pamphlet done by the U.S. Army at home, and it has uh, great athletes don't have sex. Because they're robbed of their virility. Even if you take a look at, say, the anti civil propaganda, uh, you would see things like a woman is always like this soldier, seductress, you know, uh, jukebox Jane or something like that. She gets you to have sex and pretty soon you infect it. I mean, that's what they were basically thinking. And the thing was, like, don't become sexual. But they were fighting a losing battle. You know, the mores, the Victorian code, the Edwardian period were over. You couldn't put the genie back in the bottle. What shocked me was looking at the number of women, what their religion was. And it's either they have no religion or they're basically evangelical Christians. And that means like all this stuff about no dancing or drinking, they're having sex too. But that's a reflection of our society, right? It's not a reflection of, of the times, the automobile, the silver screen, seductive sound of saxophone, jazz. Bootleg whiskey, you know, on a, on a Friday night, basically watching the moon glow in a car away from everyone, no parental control, no more chaperones to worry about. And women wanted to be just like the guys. But what protections did they really have against pregnancy or vigorous infections? There's no sex education at all. And that gets us into Crumbine's downfall. What would you say finally leads to Crumbine's downfall and the downfall of the industrial farm system itself? Crumbine was heavily influenced by the U.S. Public Health Service. And if you take a look at reports from the U.S. Public Health Service, they were realizing the best way of defeating syphilis and venereal infections was through education. So Crumbine begins proposing and sends out a brochure to Kansas high schools, one for boys and one for girls, about sexuality. This is a sex education program. This really makes sense. Of all the things he's doing about defeating, you know, venereal infections in the state, this really made sense. But could you imagine the impact that would have on parents and state legislators? Uh, they had a new governor. He blames it on the Democratic governor, but also the legislature, too, the impact this was having upon them. And so what they did was they cut the state budget for the State Department of Health by 40%. And he was fed up. And he left. Now, oh, I might add that Cromwell always has a pretty good reputation. Matter of fact, he saved Katie Med. He's a hero at the University of Kansas. But here, this is sound policy that we have now. I would have recommended to him if he was asking me, if I was living at that time, why not do serological testing for all married couples? That would have solved some of these problems. But, but he did. He didn't think about that. So he leaves state. He works with you know children health. He goes to New York. But he's still a eugenicist. Sanborn, too. Uh, she goes to KU. She leaves after two years. But that was his main uh, main downfall. But then again, he, remember, he was a champion for food safety, tuberculosis reform, fighting the pandemic, flu epidemic, don't spit on the sidewalk, uh, no more common drinking cup, the roll towel, all that sort of stuff. He's known for which he did. He did those marvelous things. He, he should be credited with all those things. But he failed in his regard because he connected sex the real infections without realizing that there was something missing in many of these things. Education would have worked. He was correct about that. But men were just as guilty as women. In some cases, there were victims, uh, particularly married women, uh, who had no idea. They were faithful to their husbands, and we find that their husbands are fooling around, so to speak. And most of the scholars, even though they discuss this, and he discusses this in, in Frontier Doctrine, he doesn't get into the, you know, the, the real revulsion that people have about sex education. In the state of Kansas. Even today, we have we have problems with sex education. What are the long term impacts of these issues, and maybe how we can use what we've learned to inform the present? What have we learned from this? Basically, we have to be on top of our own health care. We have to be aware of what's actually going on. Sometimes we take for granted that doctors know best. Sometimes we assume that judges know best. 
sometimes we see the, uh, our legislators know best. This lesson demonstrates that none of them had public interest at, at heart. They didn't fully grasp what was actually happening. Uh, this was a fad. Eugenics was a fad. It was very powerful all the way through the 1930s. It was only after World War II that basically uh, we realized the, the downfall of it, except that sterilizations would continue well into the 1960s. We're still living with that legacy. We're still living with the legacy of this. How many women basically were borderized and sterilized because one of the impacts of treatment of women with pelvic inflammatory disease was cauterization? And they couldn't pinpoint cauterization like they can today. They cauterized the whole cervix. So the impact of that is a woman could be barren. She could no longer have children as a result of this. Just, just think about that. They did horrible things. There's a picture in my article where you see a woman sitting there with her little baby. Then we just gave birth. They did these other things too. For some of the doctors knew. Uh, there were at least two doctors that were all gun ho for cauterization and cauterizing women uh, without thought. Matter of fact, they would lie about it you know, by any reports. If you look at the medical records, you're seeing numerous cauterizations. So we can learn a lot from this, not to let this happen again, not to allow ourselves to be fooled. Now, this doesn't excuse people that are anti-vaxxers, because one thing that, that Crumbine was very concerned about was vaccinations. We tend to forget that as this was going on, uh, 1917, 1918, there was outbreaks of smallpox in Canada. It's hard to imagine. It was, it was a different kind of different place. Thank you so much, Professor Lovett, for coming in, talking with us today about the industrial farms and the effect that they had on Kansas women in the early 20th century. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for listening. If you would like to learn more about the topics discussed on this podcast, consider becoming a subscriber to our journal, Kansas History, a Journal of the Central Plains. Visit our webpage on the Kansas State University's Department of History website to learn how.